I want to share with you today a message that will focus more on what's happening in this world today as well as especially with what's happening right now in the Middle East. United States has experienced events like Pearl Harbor where over 2,400 people died. We had the opportunity to visit the memorial in Hawaii and be reminded of the death toll and trauma and all the craziness that hit America. 9-11, most of you were alive when you saw on the news 9-11 where about 3,000 people died because terrorists decided to fly airplanes into Twin Towers as well as Pentagon. Well, a few, a few days ago, about a week ago, Israel has experienced America's 9-11. The worst mass um, deaths that has happened in Israel since the Holocaust where in one day a thousand three hundred people were killed and 25 of them were people from the United States. Over 120 people were kidnapped where Hamas, Iran-backed terror group controlling Gaza launched an unprovoked and vicious surprise attack on Israel using rockets paragliders, boats, motorcycles and other vehicles and whatever means they could to infiltrate Israel. Killing babies, families, murdering, snatching older people on the streets and killing young women, burning families with their children. And Hamas of course pushes a propaganda to the world by saying that you know look but Israel kills women and children when in reality they use women and children as shields. They're not the only ones. Boko Haram uses children as human bombs. And terrorists in Afghanistan have killed pregnant women and babies in maternity wards. Indonesian Islamists deploy women as suicide bombers. It happens everywhere. What happened to Israel is a modern day Amalekites attacking God's people. When Israel came out of Egypt, Amalekites came against them, attacked them in unexpectedly, viciously, indirectly and God said after that that God will defend His people and punish Amalekites. For those of you maybe and you're Christians or you're watching online and you feel like well you know this attack on Israel they deserve it because Israel they're not right. Israel they're not good. America is responsible for killing over 60 million babies. Yet 9-11 and the attack of the terrorists on American soil is not morally ever justified. Yeah. Ukraine is the number one and number two country after Russia, the most corrupt country in Europe. Yet the invasion and attacking of hospitals and, innocent, and civilians by Russian army is not absolutely justified. What we must understand as Christians is this, we grieve with the people in the Palestine. We pray for the people in the Palestine and we love because we are Gentiles just like them. Yet at the same time we must understand is that Israel has not always acted blamelessly in its conduct toward Pan Palestinian people. But it doesn't make terrorist attacks less demonic and morally justifiable. God said in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 6 and 8, our God whom we call our Father. I want you to notice what He says about this particular family, a Jewish family that started with a guy named Abraham, his wife Sarah and it grew to their children, grandchildren and it became a nation. God said this, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God word holy means separate. God took them from the Ur of Chaldeans. He took this boy, guy named Abraham. He chosen him. He gave him some promises and then his family. This is what God says about his family. He says, for the Lord your God has chosen you to be people for himself. A special treasure above the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because He would keep an oath which He swore to your fathers. 
So while different families of the earth that we became descendants of were slaughtering animals, babies and practicing witchcraft, God takes this man, Abraham, with the vision in mind to teach him his character, his vision. It's where we get a lot of the Old Testament is God dealing with the family that became a nation. And these people, they renounced witchcraft. They renounced all of this stuff, but they struggled. They had problems. If you think that Israel is holy moly God Almighty, righteous, absolutely not. Read the Old Testament. They made mistakes. They disobeyed God. They worshiped idols. I mean, they complained. They're not, the reason why we pray for Israel is not because Israel is perfect. It's because God makes it clear in His Word. He chose them to be His special people. Now if that's a trigger word for you, see a therapist. But that's God's Word. That's what God says in His Word. We don't come to God and say, Lord, but I don't like that. We accept God's Word and we find out why did God do that. And then in Deuteronomy a little bit later, in chapter 9 verse 5 it says, it's not because of your righteousness. Meaning God makes it clear. Guys, Jewish people, Israelites, he's like, it's not because you're righteous. Because they were not super righteous. He says, nor uprightness of your heart that you will go and possess the land. God says, it's because of the wickedness of the nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you. And then I want you to see this, that He may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I want you to notice in just two references I gave you, it says this, God says, I've chosen you a special people. I'm bringing you to this place called promised land, which I promised to Abraham. I then made a promise to his son Isaac, made a promise to his grandson Jacob. Israel suffered under the hands of the Egyptians. I took them out through Joshua. I'm bringing them into a piece of land. This is not symbolic. This is not an allegory. This is a physical piece of real estate that is the size of New Jersey. It's about 9 million people that is there right now. God gives them this piece of real estate. The promise God gave to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was actually a very large piece of land. Israel has never occupied that size of the land God gave them a promise. They keep getting that land chopped and that's why you see this circle where the Palestine, this whole land belonged to the Palestine and Israel is pushing the Palestinians away. Guys, I want to make something very clear. That land never belonged to the Palestinians. You know why? Because thousands of years ago God gave to Abraham there was no Palestinians. Joshua occupied that land. Islam didn't even exist for like 2,000 years yet. David, the king of Israel, was a king there. Solomon built a temple there. God punished his people because of their disobedience. The Babylonians captured them. The Assyrians destroyed some other stuff. And then God brought them back. And only 600 years after Jesus, that Islam started to make its wave in the Middle East. Roman Empire to insult Jewish people called that area Palestine. From the word Philistines because Israel always fought with Philistines. The Philistines were thrown in the flesh. So Romans to insult them called that area Palestine. That area were give, was given by God. Not UN, not United States, not Donald Trump, not even Abraham. God came to Abraham and made him a promise. Few things he said. Number one, I'll make you father of many nations. Number two, he says your seed will bless the nations of the world. And number three, I'm going to give you real estate. Now that was God's promise. Now some are like, well, I find it offensive. Be offended. But that's God's promise. If you have a problem with that and you think God should break His promise to Israel and Abraham, why should He keep His promise to you? He promised to forgive our sins. 
He promised to take us to heaven. He promised to be with us. So God keeps saying the reason why Israel is going to enter the promised land. The reason why God is dealing with them is God just keeps saying this because I made a promise to their fathers. God is going to be faithful. God is a faithful God. Can somebody say amen? amen? This land that is the fight over right now, again as Christians, please understand, for some of you like, well this is politics. This is the Bible. This is not politics. This is God's Word. God keeps His promise. Now you would say, why would God promise people real estate? He's God. He made the real estate. He wants to do whatever He wants with it. And if He would give me land, I would take it too. <laughs> Because land is very expensive. Small piece of land that is being fought and contested with for many, many years. This land is permanently belongs to the Jewish people because God said this piece of real estate will belong to Israel forever. Israel has always historically been a Jewish territory. This idea and these graphics that are circulating online that somehow this belongs to the Palestinians, um, we must understand we don't see a lot of mentions in here of God giving different pieces of land to different people except one. And that is to particular family God chose out of which He will bring His Son Jesus who will impact the world. And one of the things that God gave them to Abraham was piece of land. And God made it very clear that land is His. In 1948, Israel became recognized nation by the United Nations. The moment after its recognition, neighboring countries attacked Israel. Israel won the war in 1948 against countries like Egypt, Syria and Jordan. In 1967, these countries attacked Israel again, which led to what we know as Six Day War. Israel won the war, controlled areas like West Bank and East Jordan. Israel returned to Sin the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in 1979 but still controls other areas like West Bank and Gaza. Why am I speaking about this today at church? It's because the danger at church is this, is when Christians are drinking, getting their theological understanding from CNN than the Bible. And when we allow the propaganda of our culture to affect our worldview. And this is how it happens. When Christians believe this doctrine, it's called replacement theology. What is replacement theology? Israel has been replaced by the church. Meaning Israel was good until Jesus came. Now Jesus came, all of these prophecies were fulfilled. All of the future prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. All that matters is Christians, Jesus and God took Israel, completely crossed it off of the map. They're no longer on the table. God will not deal anything with Israel. The future prophecies of Jesus coming to Israel, saving Israel, all of that stuff is completely off the table and it's only Jesus and His church. That would mean that God canceled His promise to Abraham. If he broke his promise to Abraham, how long is it going to take him to break his promise to you? That's a dangerous way to believe. And for those of you who believe in that, I'm going to tell you that you are in error. Because the Bible does not teach that. This is what the Bible teaches. In Romans chapter 11 verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Paul is very clear. There is a blindness that has taken place with Israel. If you watch the interview with Ben Shapiro and Joe Rogan, and Joe Rogan asked Ben Shapiro about what he thinks about Jesus, and Ben Shapiro straight up, what normal Jewish people who don't believe in Messiah say about Jesus. Jesus got killed, he deserved it. Why? Because he rebelled against Roman Empire. He never rose from the dead. He's not the son of God. It's just Christians made him into a son of God. This is Jew Jewish Messiah. How could somebody smart like Ben Shapiro say that? 
Paul says to us, who's also a Jewish writer, and says this, that there is a blindness in part, meaning not all Jewish people are blind. Dr. Michael Brown, who I interviewed just a few days, a few, few weeks ago, he's, he's a, he speaks and has a PhD. He's a Jewish believer. Sid Roth is a Jewish believer. And so many more. The, um, Jonathan Kahn, who just also recently interviewed about the return of the gods. He's a messianic rabbi. There's a lot of messianic believers all around the world. But there is in part partial blindness and hardness that is allowed by God that when they rejected Messiah. But Paul is saying this, so that the fullness of Gentiles, meaning as they are blinded, God almost like extended open wide door to the rest of us heathens. The Gentiles, the pagan worshippers, the one who worshipped the moon, the stars and weird bizarre stuff. Who didn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But we worship Jupiter. We worship some other Baal. We worship some other stuff. And God says, while the hearts of their are blind temporarily and in part, the fullness of Gentiles, the Slavics, the Asians, the Hispanics, and so many of them will come into my kingdom and worship Jesus the Messiah and love Him and will serve Him. But I remind you, Jesus revealed Himself when He was on this earth as a Jewish king. He said of Himself that He is the very king. Jesus Himself was rejected by Jewish people, but it was predicted by a Jewish prophet, Isaiah. And then Jesus took His Jewish disciples and gave them the good news and said, Now and go fulfill Abraham's promise that you will in the seed will be blessing to the nations and go to all the nations because for the first time Jewish descendants who have this message of Jesus are spreading this to all the nations. Up to that point they were staying away from the nations. They were trying not to get contaminated by the nations and now they're spreading the good news everywhere until this Jesus comes back and restores things back to its order. Same Romans chapter 11 verse 26, Paul says this, And all Israel will be saved. So this idea that God is done with Israel, God is only working now with the church and Israel, they just went kind of their own way. They killed Jesus and, and all of this stuff. Paul is saying, God says all Israel will be saved. I love verse 28. Concerning the gospel, they, Israelites, Jewish people, are enemies for your sake. Ouch. That means when we talk Jesus, Messiah, gospel, they're enemies. But concerning the election, they are beloved. A friend of mine, Joel Richardson says, they are your beloved enemies. Jewish people concerning the gospel, they're enemies. They don't believe in the gospel. They think we cuckoo crazy. But concerning the election, and you remember the Bible says that God's callings and God's election is irrevocable. God doesn't take it away. They are our beloved people. Amen. Now, in the Old Testament, there are different prophetic pictures of the future of Jesus, the Messiah, that He plays in the history of the church, but specifically to Israel. And that's what I want to, the next few moments I want to talk about is His future as it relates to the Jewish state and to the people of Israel. One of the pictures that I personally always enjoy in the Bible is the story of Joseph. Joseph is one of the clearest pictures of Jesus, like a shadow and a type. Joseph was beloved of his father. Joseph was like a savior. He brought bread to his brothers. Joseph gets rejected by his brothers for the price of 30 shekels. Joseph gets falsely accused. Joseph gets thrown into a dungeon between two crazy people, one of which gets beheaded or killed and the other one gets promoted. Joseph marries a Gentile bride 
And Joseph is, on the, is the second right-hand man to the main guy in charge, Pharaoh. And Joseph spends time feeding hungry people. Now do you see Jesus? Is God said about Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is sent to his own, the Bible says, but his own received him not. Jesus gets rejected by his own. Jesus gets sold for a price of 30 coins. Jesus gets falsely accused. In fact, they held a trial at night and by six different courts, he gets falsely accused. He doesn't get hanged for his crimes. He gets accused falsely and he gets killed. On the cross, Jesus is hanging between two criminals, one out of which goes to paradise and the other one goes into the lake of fire, renouncing Christ. Jesus gets raised from the dead, goes from a prison to the palace and he sits at the right hand of our Father. Jesus has a bride and that bride is the church. Gentiles, you and I. But do you know how Joseph's story ends? Joseph and his brothers reconcile. First time they come, they don't recognize him. So they don't reconcile. Second time they come, they don't recognize him. He's, in their mind, Joseph is dead. That's how a lot of Jewish people today, in their mind, Jesus is dead. He never rose from the dead. He's not who Christians claim him to be. He's gone. They're still waiting for a Messiah. While he, Jesus, is currently feeding the Gentile world through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, healing the sick, driving out demons, and we, not being Jewish, worship Jewish King. We're benefiting like Egypt is benefiting from Joseph and his own family is not recognizing, thinking he's dead. And that's exactly what's happening. Jewish people in part are blind toward the fact Joseph reigns. He's not dead. Jesus reigns. He's not dead. He's not a heretic who was using magic to do miracles. He was filled by the Spirit of God. He fulfilled 300 33 prophecies given by God in the Old Testament. In fact, somebody did the math and they said 150 of prophecies about Jesus occurred in six hours when Jesus hung on the cross. That's a lot of prophecies. So about half of the prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled in six hours. Now a doctor or professor, Peter Stoner, professor of mathematics said this, the probability of just 8 out of 333 coming to pass is equivalent to covering the state of Texas, which is about 268,000 square miles, two feet deep in silver coins, one of which has a special mark on it, and then expecting a blindfolded man to walk across the state on the very first try to find the one coin you marked. A professor of mathematics says to just take eight prophecies out of 333 and have one person fulfill them. The chance of that is filling the state of Texas two feet silver coins marking one coin and sending a blindfolded man to find exactly that coin. The probability is it's mind-blowing. It's supernatural. So Jewish people they reject their Messiah just like the brothers of Joseph. But I want you to notice on the third visit to Egypt, Joseph hides no more. He tells them, I am Joseph. And what happens is they wept. The Bible says, they will see him whom they pierced and they will weep. Did you know that Israel entered the promised land third time? The first time, was in Joshua. The second time was when Ezra and Nehemiah came back from the exile. And that exile was about 70 years. The third time, this exile lasted over 2000, about 2,000 years. It's when they lost Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple. And now in 1948, Israel came back the third time into the land. 
The Bible says if you want to know what's happening in the last days, you look at a fig tree. The fig tree is Israel. Meaning when you see it's budding, the summer is coming, something is happening. Jesus is going to land on the Mount of Olives. He will defend Israel during a very difficult war. But that couldn't happen if Israel didn't exist. That means the time is coming. When they came into the land third time, Jesus A.K. Joseph is about to reveal himself again. He is coming back. And the Bible says every eye will see Him. The Bible says there will be a sound of a trumpet when He will come. And the Jewish people who said He's dead, He's nobody, He's false Messiah. They will weep and they will embrace Him as their King and as their Messiah. Come on somebody. You know, the Old Testament is Messiah concealed. The New Testament is the Messiah revealed. The whole Bible is not really about a family. It's about God choosing a family to bring forth His Son that will touch the world. And that God controls the whole narrative and then that family will be the family that God will use to bring His Son back and take the seat as the King of David as the son of David, on the, on the throne of David. Israel had seven feasts. In America we have holidays. Fourth of July, Memorial Weekend, Labor Day weekend, Martin Luther Day. It seems like every month is, we're celebrating something. And every day is some kind of a celebration. A cat day, a carpet day, a lights day, you know, a moon day. So, and, and it's good to have days where you celebrate things. Israel had seven main holidays. Interesting, all the seven main holidays are really symbol of Jesus. Four of them happened in the spring, three of them happened in the fall. The first one was the Passover, you probably heard of it. It's when the lamb was killed. Interesting, when Jesus came and the actual Passover is when Jesus the lamb was killed. The second holiday Israel had is called unleavened bread. Now this might go over your head right now, just hang in for a second. Unleavened bread was symbolic of Jesus' burial because Messiah's sinless, sinless life as Laban is picture of sin in the Bible, making Him the perfect sacrifice for our sin. The third holiday Israel had is called first fruits, meaning you bring first fruits to God and it speaks of Jesus' resurrection as the first fruit of the dead. Interestingly, Jesus is getting raised from the dead as the first fruit. And then there is one more holiday, few days, about 50 days after. And this holiday is called the day of Pentecost. And on this day, God pours out His Spirit upon the church. And then we hit the spiritual summer. Because in Israel then, you know, they get the summer. There's no holidays. And this is where we're at right now. And then there comes the fall and the fall has three more holidays. And the first one of this is called the trumpets. The second one is called the day of atonement. And the third one is called the tabernacles. Hang in with me. Are you still with me? Okay. The trumpets is you blow the trumpet. The Bible says that the, that, that the angel will sound a trumpet and those who are dead will rise and they will meet Christ in the air and there is going to be a reunion of this Jesus, the Son of God, coming down on earth and we will be changed in a twinkling of an eye and we will be with the Lord. The sound of a trumpet, the feast of trumpets is symbolic of Jesus' second coming. Then Israel has one more feast called the, the Day of Atonement. It's kind of not a feast, more like a fast because they were supposed to afflict their souls and not eat. It's when they mourn. It's when they repent. You know what that speaks of? When that happens, Israel will mourn and weep looking at Him whom they've rejected before. And there is one more feast called the Tabernacles. It's when Israel lived for seven days in booths. And this is the same word that is used in Revelation that the Lord Himself will tabernacle with us, meaning He will dwell with us on earth for 1,000 years and then another 1,000 years, then another 1,000 and forever. Come on somebody, let's give King Jesus the Messiah, our Savior, our Lord and our King.
A round of applause. Now, Israel missed Jesus' first coming because they were fixed on His second coming. Most of us are not interested in the second coming because we're so impacted by His first coming. When Jesus came, they expected the King to come. But instead, they got a priest and they also got someone who was a prophet. He has three functions. Jesus has three functions. As a prophet, he fulfilled that in the three years of his ministry. As a priest, he fulfilled that by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. There's one more function and that's what Israel was expecting is the king. He will rule and reign. Did you know there is eight times more verses in the Bible about Jesus' second coming than about his first coming? Eight times more. Did you know there's at least 300 references in the New Testament about Jesus' second coming. Paul refers to it in his epistles at least 50 times. A few things about his second coming. It will be visible, personal, literal and glorious. Some people say, and this is right now becoming trendy in Christianity, that this second coming of Jesus is symbolic. There's going to be no trumpet. It's just you in your heart. No cloud. No, this is just when, when you feel the presence. He's not going to be hitting the Antichrist. Antichrist is the bad nature in you. Yes, you can apply some symbolism and everything, but Jesus made it very clear that His appearance will be visible. It says it's from one side of the earth to the other. And I think how that's going to happen is live streaming. And lightning will shoot up throughout the earth. And Jesus, it will be a loud sound that will come in. It won't be quiet. It won't be like people, wise men trying to calculate the stars, figure out where is the king of the Jews. No, no, no. It won't be like that. It will be so loud. The Bible says that there will be a loud. So those of you who don't like loud stuff, get some earplugs because this is going to get loud. The sound of a trumpet from heaven. There's the lightning that's taking place. It is visible and the Bible says every eye will see. This is not going to be hidden. Fox will stream it. CNN will stream it. TikTok will stream it. Everybody is going to see it. It's going to be glorious. It's not going to be some weak years coming. That light is not working and that light. Everything will work. And it's not going to ride a Tesla. A white horse. <laughs> Gotta get them horses again. Come on somebody. Or maybe, <laughs> just got this idea. Maybe he's gonna have some spaceship that has horsepower. <laughs> I don't know. That's just speculation. His second coming will be gathering the saints. So not only it's visible, glorious, powerful. It's gathering the saints. I have another message where I deal with will Christians go through tribulation or not. But I want to highlight just one thing. The Bible says, we will be caught up to meet Him in the air. It will be immediately transformed as this is happening. Our bodies will change. The dead will be raised and we will meet the Lord in the air at His coming. Now, the traditional mainline teaching in American culture is this. We go up, spend seven days there while the world burns to hell. And then we come down and rescue the poor Jewish people. But the word at His coming, the word coming there is the Greek word for parousia. Parousia is when an important person comes to a city and a delegation from the city would go out to meet him and then escort him on his way to the city. It's used 24 times in the Bible. My personal and many people in this room believe and that Christians will be protected during tribulation but we will not be rescued completely from it because God didn't rescue people before in the last 2,000 years and Christians are the only ones who can endure it and He will use them still to expand His kingdom. We can disagree with that and still be nice but the benefit why people in America believe that we won't be going through hard stuff is because we have the luxury of growing up in a country that has Christian values and if somebody hurts you, you sue them. That's not the luxury the rest of the world has or had for 2,000 years. 
So it's important that our ideas don't come from the place of our experience, but come from a place of biblical understanding. The Bible makes no distinction between two comings of Jesus, one at rapture and then one at second coming. The Bible says about one second coming of Jesus and the Bible makes it very clear it will be parousia. Let me give you an example. If I bring a guest speaker to Hungry Gen and a given direction to get to Hungry Gen, usually one of our guys would go in the parking lot, parousia. They would go at the parking lot, meet him as they're coming in, help him to find a parking space and escort him into one of the offices. So what the Bible says about Jesus coming, Romans would do that. Roman emperor or a general would go conquer a nation, come back with the, with the bounty and then some of the officials would meet him halfway right outside of the gates and together escort walk into the city in the parade. That's the word Paul is using. The church gets raptured, we get transformed, we meet the Lord mid-air and we come with Jesus as His feet. The Bible says in Zechariah 14.4, land on the Mount of Olives. While He's landing on the Mount of Olives, the beast, the Antichrist, who the spirit of Antichrist has already been running everywhere, but there is still the bad boy Antichrist will come. He will be a man that will somehow organize the Middle East and create one global currency, at least in that part of the world. He will be extremely charismatic and likable. He will be wealthy and try to restore the wealth and the dignity of that world and he will have one religion. His specialty in his religion will be beheading people. Which kind of gives you a cue. Which religion right now has a goal of dominating the world and as its punishment they cut people's heads off? And which religion in the world has an expectation of a coming Messiah that point for point fits the description of our Antichrist. I'll let you stew on that. This bad boy Antichrist makes a deal with Israel. Interestingly, Islam eschatology, meaning the end times for Islam, has their Messiah coming and this Messiah of Islam will sign a seven year peace treaty with Jews. So who they're expecting to be their Messiah is who Christians believe is Antichrist who signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. And in the middle of that seven peace treaty, seven-year treaty, he, the temple is already built, he desecrates the temple and for Jewish people you just desecrate the temple, you, that's it, you, you go, it's bad. And then the war begins to happen against Israel. The nations come against Israel. So the temple has to be built. The, the, the institute of temple, the temple institute in Israel already have the schematics and pretty much everything ready to build the temple except the location, the, the, the dome, the Islam headquarters is on that place. And I believe we are standing very close what we might be seeing, in, in, even in our lifetime, maybe not, not in our lifetime, in our children's lifetime, where this shift can happen in Israel, where the temple will be built, where this peace will be made with this person who's going to try to invade Israel eventually, cause headache and suffering. We go to the Lord in the air, we come down and His feet land, not in London, not in Kiev, not in Moscow, not in LA, not in New York, on the Mount of Olives. And when he lands, he's not arriving as a guest speaker at Jerusalem Baptist Convention. He's not coming as a guest speaker in the Christian organization. He's coming as a man of war. And I know some of us do not know that kind of Jesus yet. We're like, man, I love Jesus that gives hugs and kisses. You know, turn the other cheek 100%. The priest, the prophet. But we will see another nature of our maker of galaxies of what is seen and unseen when he arrives and his feet land on the Mount of Olives few things will happen number one he will defend Israel because Israel will need that number two he will kill the Antichrist oh no I'm not talking about spiritually Pow! Like the Bible says with the breath with his breath he will kill the, that man meaning Jesus will arrive he will open his mouth and the sword will come out and that man will be dead. Because that man cannot be killed except by real Christ who shows up and who arrives. And then what Jesus will do, something that's also shocking, he will judge 
the nations and rule them. There will be no voting, no mail-in voting. Nobody's going to be asked about do you want him or not. Kings don't operate like that. He's not a dictator. Dictator is wannabe king. The real king of the universe already died. Came on a donkey humbly and had humanity strip his beard, beat him and smite him and he took all of that for the sins of humanity. He's the only one worthy to rule the earth because his robe is dipped in blood and this Jesus who went to heaven in a cloud. The Bible says the angels came back and said the same way he went up and the same way, not symbolically, not in an allegory spiritually, the same way, physically, visibly, gloriously, he will come down with the church and his feet will land on the Mount of Olives and he will establish his kingdom, defend Israel, kill the bad boy antichrist and he will judge the nations but what, what if they will get triggered <sighs> the bible says every knee will bow and every but when the devil will be bound most people will not be triggered anymore <laughs> they'll be okay they'll recognize jesus is messiah he's the king he has stripes in his hands he did bled and died He's the rightful king. That's what the second coming is coming. What do we do about it? Well, number one, the Bible actually tells us to wait for his second coming. My re recommendation, we should wait for Jesus' second coming, not for Trump's second coming. <laughs> yeah. Our hope we're not expecting to make America great again. Not against that. I love America. And I think we need a good president and I think Trump is a great one. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying Trump is a pastor, good, can make a good pastor. No, 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 absolutely not. He's not a good spiritual leader. But we're not voting for a pastor. We're voting for somebody who can establish things that honor God. But our hope, we don't wait for the second coming of Trump. We wait for the second coming of Messiah. Can somebody say Amen? <laughs> Secondly, God is not done with Israel, therefore we pray for its peace. God is not done with Israel, therefore we lift Israel in peace. Again, does it mean it justifies some of the other things that Israel has going on? Absolutely not. Somebody sent me an article where Israel sold weapons to countries that were attacking Armenia. Make no mistake, we are not whitewashing and making Israel pretend that everything they do is right. Absolutely not. What we're saying is according to God's Word, it's God's special people because of the promise He made to Abraham. All the writers of the Bible came from this territory. Jesus went up from this place. He's coming back to this place. They have a special role in God's plan and we have to honor that and pray for Jerusalem. Why is there such an attack? on that small piece of real estate because the devil knows that's where the future king that's when the uncontested once he arrives it's the end game it's the end game and he will do whatever it takes make sure that Israel does not exist as a nation before that but the devil tried it before he will try again and it won't happen he won't succeed and we have to lift God's people in prayer. Just because they're blind right now, it doesn't mean God is not merciful and doesn't want to open their eyes. Number three, while we wait for Jesus' second coming, we must work hard to make sure everybody else hears about His first coming. Many people don't know Jesus. They know about Him, they don't know Him. Number four, we must train believers to endure suffering, not just teach them, to enjoy blessings. Now again, I lived in the United States for 23 years. I love blessings. I love peace. I love that if you threaten us in school, we can sue you. 
I love that if the government comes and, you know, says you can't meet and take you to court, you get good lawyers and you sue the living lights out of them. Make millions of dollars in the process, make Jesus know. I love the fact that we have more lawyers in America than I think all the world combined. I love that. I love the fact that we have freedom in America and I have a gun and a license to carry. I love that. I love that we live in a blessed country. But please make no mistake. The rest of the world and for the last 2,000 years, that's not the pleasure people have enjoyed. And we should protect these liberties. But we should also understand with all of the liberties we and blessings we experience in America, we should never take them for granted. And we should always remember this is not heaven. There is still bones are gonna break. There is still hearts are gonna break. We still live in a difficult time where you will be misunderstood, you will be judged. And instead of building this soft believers who have a pacifier and act like toddlers in the nursery, super easily offended. Small little thing they go through and that's it, they quit their faith. I can't go to church, why somebody offended me? We cannot build this easily offended, this selfish little centered. Now if you're just a baby Christian, you're totally welcome. Babies are also welcome in the church. But if you've been with the Lord for 10 years, it's time to take the pacifier out. Take the sword of the Spirit in and become strong in the Lord. Endure hardship. That means it's okay to go through difficult times. The way of Jesus is narrow and difficult. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For crying out loud, let's not be snowflakes. Let's be soldiers. Let's be an army. But we will be misunderstood. They killed Jesus. We'll be called with names. They call him heretic. Oh, but they will hurt us. They stoned Stephen. No, like not stoned like he got drunk. Physically stoned. The Christianity went through that. My great grandparents suffered for the cause of Christ and then was murdered. They couldn't meet freely and they still served Jesus. My mom was baptized during the winter in cold ice and that was fine. She's still serving Jesus. She didn't denounce Jesus and say, oh, the cameras were not there. My hair didn't look good. And you know what? It was not super comfortable and the water was not warm. And so we have to raise new believers from our youth today that are not easily offended, that are not just afraid or allergic to hardship. That if, if hardships come, if persecution comes, not that we have a martyrdom mentality, but we're not scared. We're not afraid. What can they do? They can kill the body, but that's it. And if the time comes and over, oh, you know, if I stand up for faith and if I, you know, confess Jesus, I may lose my job. Come on. You know, and it happened during COVID, people were like, man, but I, I, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to do anything. I know it's against my conscience, but I don't want to lose my job. Come on. When we reopened our church during COVID, I knew it was illegal. But I also, with our board, decided that, you know what? If a million people can riot, loot, and defecate on the parking lot with masks, and that was okay, then if people want to come and worship Jesus, we will let them. And we let our local governments know, hey, we honor the local government. We love these people. We don't blame them because it really comes from over there. Dr. Pepper, I mean, the, the Fauci and, and other people and the government and all of this stuff and all of these restrictions. But we told our local law enforcement, the chief of police and the, and the state representatives and others say, listen, this stuff, we know now that it's not some big scary thing. People recover from it. We will tell our elderly people to stay home and we will reopen our services. We will not require masks and we will not enforce social distancing. And we made it very clear. I gave him my personal number and I said, when you're gonna make the arrest, text me first. I will come out quietly. Because if you come out storm, we do have people that are armed and we just do not want any problems. We do not want to have any news. Just, just arrest me, put me in jail. Lawyers will hush it out next morning. I'll be back home. Everything will be fine. And all of our local representatives messaged back and they said this. This was during COVID so I can say that now. They said, who arrest what? Vlad, chill. None of us agree with most of this stuff. Just don't tell your congregation that we're okay with it. So that's why I didn't tell you guys that during COVID. Now I can tell you that because the statue of limitation passed. <laughs> and not one person died. 
but the church quadrupled. Why? Because we have to endure suffering, misunderstanding. I was made fun of by local pastors with who I'm friends with and the, the, the week where we opened with a pastor's meeting and a lot of very harsh words were spoken to people who reopen against the mandates. And I said, I'm sorry guys, my great-grandfather sat in jail and suffered for Christ because the communists told him keep his mouth shut and not to gather together. And he didn't keep his mouth shut. He got killed and I owe him not to keep my mouth shut. We're going to preach the gospel. We will gather. And there is nothing the governor can do about it. We will serve Jesus. We must obey God, not the government. And the government is not going to be our God. We respect the government, but when the government has an overreach, we're not going to allow that. And if that comes with the price of a little bit of suffering, and if that scares somebody, like, man, I don't want to go to church like that. I'm okay. There's plenty of churches that will not take a hard stand. But I want to tell you here is that we do not see controversy for the sake of controversy. But we believe the Bible is the Word of God. It might be narrow. Jesus is the only way to salvation. We believe a marriage is between a man and a woman. We believe you cannot choose your gender and boys should not be in girls' bathrooms. We believe the state has no right to indoctrinate our children and to teach them things that are contrary to biology and to common sense. And we believe the, sh the state has no right to shelter, steal children, mutilate them, indoctrinate them and to brainwash them. We stand on that and it's not political, it's our family, it's our faith and it's going to be our future. Amen. And we're going to build a church that is strong. Church that's sacrificial. A church that will lay their life for Jesus and live without regrets. Amen. Number five, we will not merely maintain, we will multiply. Meaning, we're not hiding. We are going to multiply. We're not going to we're not an aquarium of exotic fish. We're going to fish for souls. What you saw today in the presentation about schools. Our church is not a destination, it's a gas station. That means we go into the world. And if they kick us out of schools, they cannot kick us out of football games. And that means that we will go and reach students. We will help other people. We're not here to maintain. There are churches today, their goal is to preserve their tradition. That's why you see in America speaking a different language and the goal is this. We just want to keep our family. We just want to reach our kids. We just don't want to lose our kids. My pastor who started this church from the beginning when I was 13 years of age, he said this. We are not here to save our family. We're here to touch the culture. And he says, all of you 13 year olds, learn English fast. I wasn't born in the United States. That's why you hear this little cute accent. Or scary, a little harsh, strong R's. Why is that? My wife is not Ukrainian, she's Russian. We got people from like different nations here. Why? Because our church doesn't exist for us. Our church exists so we can multiply. That's why we're getting a new building. Why? Because it's not because we want to have a big church. I don't get a benefit from that. It's about the fact that Jesus wants us while this is happening. He says, until I come, occupy. Until I come, do business. Disciples said, is it now you will reestablish the kingdom? And Jesus says, don't worry about this part. I'll come back when it's my time. But you'll receive power. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Preach the gospel. Start small groups. Start on the shame clubs. Build families. Get married, have children, buy a house, build a business, support God's kingdom, have revival in the church and reformation in the society. Why is there a focus on schools? Every Sunday you come in like, man, I thought it's an adult service. Why, why, why are we talking about that? Because the school is the source of society. It's where all the young children go in. It's where seeds are planted that, that germinate in colleges. And then 15 years down the road, these people are our doctors. These people are our lawyers. These people are our senators. And these people are our football players, influencers. And if we fill them with garbage in high school, middle school and college, and what we have is we have these people who are now broken in their mind by the world system. 
We don't want just revival in the church. We want reformation in society. And that cannot happen if we only hide in the church. We got to go into the world. Revival in the church. Reformation in our society. Reformation in Tri-Cities. Reformation in our schools. Reformation in our school system. In our media and in the world. That's why you see the youth service moved from Wednesday night to Sunday night. The old traditional model is this. A kid, if you get saved, quit football. Leave the world, meaning any activities and go to church and spend all the time in church. When that, that model, the problem with that model is this. You have revival at the expense of reformation. The model of Hungry Gen is this. We're fishers of men and you don't go fishing in the bathtub. You have to go to where the fish is. That's why there's an emphasis online. That's why one of the things your, your pastor does it streams online and does all of this stuff. Why? Because that's where the world is at right now. We are not here to put light in the light room or put light in the dark place. Put salt where it needs to be. We are here not to maintain but to multiply. In the midst of persecution Israel multiplied and so will we. China's church is multiplying in persecution so will we if persecution comes. And the last thing we don't have fear, we live on fire. We don't fear Antichrist, we don't fear Hamas, we don't fear terrorism, we don't fear jail and we don't fear death. Now will we feel it if it comes close? Maybe for a little bit. But what we do is we take all of our life and burn for Jesus. We fear God too much to fear death. We live for the one who died for us. We don't live with fear. Even the end times for us, when we look at what's happening in the world, it doesn't bring us fear. What we do is we get on fire for God. Let's pray. Let's fast. Let's build things for God. Let's live for Jesus. Why? Because hell was always doing its thing. Hell can't stop what heaven started for watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.